Allo. Yes. Good morning. Um, welcome to everyone who uh, uh, woke up and uh, <laughs> decided to come here to listen to this uh, very um, interesting and uh, I'm sure passioning uh, masterclass. Uh, I want, f before opening the masterclass, uh, to uh, welcome the new board of director of the Greek Association of Documentary and uh, the new president, uh, Aneta Pat Papathanasiou. <laughs> And for their support and their collaboration with the festival as well. Um, and now the masterclass, uh, Nils Pag uh, Anderson, uh, who uh, is a superstar, we have to say, um, of uh, editing. Uh, we all have in mind his, the films that he has edited, uh, The Act of Killing, uh, The uh, Human Flow, uh, the uh, look of silence uh, among uh, millions of others and also he just um, published a book uh, Order in Chaos uh, which tells about the art of editing and uh, so the floor is yours thank you for coming welcome again in Thessaloniki thank you <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes. Good morning. I'm very happy to be here in Thessaloniki. It's my first time. I'm a little shameful to say that. But I have uh, been in Greece, uh, not on, only on holiday, but on work and uh, doing master classes so I know a little the the Greek documentary community and it's wonderful to see friends and and all of you yes uh, where do we start we start by saying I'm not a superstar I'm a film editor and film editors, we are used to hide behind the director. And uh, it's a very comfortable place to be for us editors. Because we are deeply involved in the creative process of creating a film, finding a story in a complex material but we can hide a little we don't have to stand in front uh, so and i think it it's also uh, i think it's part of editor's temperament it is that we like to be part of things but not be in front uh, but uh, yeah, now uh, without being a superstar, I somehow by making this book, then I also have to stand out in the limelight and, uh, and say, here I am, this is my book, this is my vision, uh, this is me. And... Uh, the the book uh yeah my 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 story is that i started working with film when i was 16 years old i was lucky to be assistant on fiction film for a very very good danish editor and I was, uh, what should I say, a, a young man who has just a big passion for film in general. Every, it's the passion that young men can have toward rock music or football or some. It's just fantastic. Everything that is film is fantastic. So, uh, 
it was a big passion, uh, but maybe also naive and a little uncritical. But come on, I was 16 years old. So, uh, and uh, then I, I, I made a quite, I think I was around 20 when I started editing myself. And I was editing my first fiction uh, when I was 23. I had a career in fiction that was just going uphill very fast. I was happened to edit a Norwegian uh, film, a fiction film that was nominated for an Oscar and the director and me then, of course, then we went Hollywood, you know, big production, all what this young man years before had been dreaming of. And then I suddenly, not suddenly, I was working like hell, I was, uh, didn't have any private life, really. It was just this work, work, work. And work with what I loved, but sudden, but after this, then I, I lost the, the passion. And uh, And I almost gave up editing because I couldn't get my creative juices floating anymore. And uh, then I, I have been editing documentary films in between and of course early in my career, but that was, you know, just something I was exercising on. It wasn't the real thing, the real film, it was fiction. But then I realized that um, that I should get something back, not only money, not only the prestige of, of working in Hollywood and all that, because I found out that was empty. That wasn't a real fulfillment. I should learn something. I should get something back that were, what should I say, uh, worth all the effort, all the hard work I was putting into films. So I turned more and more, or the, no, I turned into documentary film. And in documentary films, there I learned something. The beautiful thing about documentary film, it is that reality is never like you think it is. So as a human being, I got challenged with all my prejudices about how the, wor the world is or how some people are. We all have prejudices, even us, intelligent, smart, lefty, we all have prejudices because else, you know, we need to categorize and, and so on to make life easier and to navigate in life. So there I, with documentary films, I ended, so to speak, on the right shelf. I, I was learning and also I will say the, the documentary world, the documentary directors, are people who also want to tell the world something. 
uh, which is not always the case in fiction film. The fiction film world is so full of a lot of fluffy, all these star things and red carpet and a lot of money and actors and so on, which also creates to, to, to survive in that business. You also have to be playing that game or even liking that game. So to my experience, the directors I was working with were also more interesting people. And I also think one of the, 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 the big differences, and now I'm speaking very general, because of course there are exceptions in everything. But I think one of the thing about documentary uh, film director, it is also you need to be humble. Because if you go out in the world and you want ordinary people to open up their heart and tell their story or show their life, then you have to be in a humble position. Because if you are playing the big director, you know, no, 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 here, blah, 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 do like this. The, these things you need to do as a fiction film director when you are standing on a set with 100 people. Then you have to show your power, your ego, you have to be in front of, of the situation and show control. But as a documentary director, you have to be humble to get what you want. So the people I was working with were also people that I found much more interesting because it was not about their ego or their success. It was that the film that we were making uh, that was the center. So uh, that is a little uh, my my backstory. Uh, so, and then uh, I would say one other thing that is very important. I think also in the in in the difference between fiction and documentary film as an editor, it is also that you as an editor in documentary, you are part of finding the story out of a chaotic material, where in fiction you are adjusting or balancing a script that has been written three years ago. And this I find very interesting because when you tell a story, it is also where you condense down a piece of reality down to a, a moral point of view. You know, a story has a kind of conclusion that have a view on the world. So this being part of that, I find it very much fulfilling. And I, even that I will say there's much more prestige in fiction. Uh, there are more money. And, uh, but it's much easier. It is easier, I will say, often it's much harder to edit a documentary film than to edit a fiction. Because as an editor, you also have the responsibility to out from the director's vision, but be a partner in that uh, job or that journey to, to find a story. 
then I will say, um, I when when the so so I started as sixteen years old as assistant, so I never attended any film school. At that time in Denmark, there wasn't any education for film editors. There were more a kind of mentor system, which were not official at all. It was that an older editor were having a system and then they were bringing forward their knowledge and you were working and, and, and with them. And uh, so everything, I knew it was learning by doing. Uh, and then watching my mentor and being in the editing room while taking care of all the trims and, 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 and so on as an assistant. And uh, at that time, there was this beauty that it was on real films. So the assistants were taking all the trim and organizing and was part of the process of editing all the time where today with computers, we hardly see our assistants because they are organizing the material when we editors are not there. And I think there is a pity in that because this to follow a process where you are not the one who has the responsibility, but just being present in a process and watching and, and, and so on. That is, uh, have been very useful for me. Uh, but then I would say 25, 30 years ago, uh, st I started to teach. I was doing some small, uh, I would not call it, master class, I was doing some small teaching here and there at workshops and, and so on. And that was very important part of my development as an editor. Because now it was not only when I was working with my director, then okay, wow, it works. Then everything was fine. We, the director was happy. I was happy. Then, then, then we just continue. But by teaching, I was forced to articulate why did it work. So by teaching, I started to develop a language about what I was doing. It was not enough that it works. I had to explain why does it work. So that consciousness of what I was doing, of course, also made me more clear of, and I could analyze and, and understand, and I got another conscious, and therefore I also could be better in develop my skills as an editor. So I learned by teaching and I always seen teaching as a learning process for me as much as for my students. Um, and then, uh, yeah, maybe 10 years ago, a little longer, uh, I got a job as professor in editing at the Norwegian Film School. I only had to teach there 20 days a year. That was perfect for me because I still wanted to keep editing and not only 
teaching only makes it's a beautiful, very important job, but this combination for me was was important. And that opened up for some money so I could have some paid time to do uh, artistic research and uh, to find out in a bigger perspective what the hell have I been doing for the last 40 years. Not only because when I have been teaching, of course, at the film school, there is a kind of, yeah, you have to over three years learn the student this and this and that. And when I was doing this kind of master class and so on, then it was a film that I was talking about or a subject and so on. But was there a bigger pattern? Was there something aligned in what I have been doing? Was there a bigger understanding of something that I had time to think about and to write down? So that ended up in this book, Order and Chaos, which is, uh, what should I call it? It, it is, a, as a storyteller and, and, and so on, I would say it's a little bit a mess. <laughs> uh, because it's, it's both a teaching book and then it is my personal journey in documentary filmmaking and the different uh, phases and understanding I have been going through. And then it is also a look at Western, maybe mainly North European documentary films developing over the last 40 years. And uh, because one of the th a few good things about getting old, it is that you get perspective. Suddenly you have, you know, a much bigger perspective of things and one of the things that I started to think about it is was why are we why did we tell stories in a different ways in the 80s than we are doing in the 90s and and so on. So suddenly I could helicopter myself up and start to think about the way that we are telling stories are also not only affected by the different trends that and reaction to trends that are coming, but much more that we documentary filmmakers are also so much part, like everybody else, part of our time. And the way that we are telling stories are telling us something about how we human are seeing ourselves. And there, and maybe, maybe it's it, it 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 was just me who, because I haven't been so much to schools and universities and and so on. Maybe it was me who was dumb, uh, but 
but that was uh, was a very was very interesting to to dig into and try to understand that. One thing we um, where it, it's 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 good with history. It is, it's always good to know where are we coming from. We can't predict what will come, but to understand uh, where we are, then it's good to know where we are coming from. And I will say the, sorry, I just need a little water. Documentary film started, and I can say that I think globally it started as very much as educational film. It was films made by governmental officers to educate their populations. It was film uh, either made by governmental officers or private companies that wanted to show something about their work or their company in a, a filmic way. And it was, so the whole purpose was very much to educate countries, uh, population in being good citizens. It was often driven by a voiceover, you know, that it was kind of controlled in, in a way where there was a purpose of now remember to use less gas or do this and that. That sounds that it could be, you know, it's not very maybe interesting artistically film, but we all know from the 40s and the 50s and so on, there are masters within that genre as well. So this that you have limitations, it's not always bad. You know, all art is about finding limitations. And we also remember from the former Soviet Union, this with censorship also made the Russian filmmakers, you know, very, you know, I'm not for censorship, but it also gave them a creativity that this, that you have certain limits. But then what happened very much, and that is what I will say, that is where the big change come and is the period where today's free documentary film is it's much more uh, founded. It is in the 60s where there comes a reaction to this governmental uh, control of the, their system, a citizen, and, uh, and it is both, uh, uh, it's a, a combination of that there suddenly comes new techniques. There suddenly comes small light, cameras, 16 millimeters, instead of 
shoots, camera, where so the mobility and you didn't need so much light and all those things that you had to have beforehand to make films. It was heavy camera. So it was because of a, a new, new technology that was doing the change. But even more, it was, of course, what happened in the 60s. It was where there was a revolt against authorities. Within, there was a new lift that was raising. So suddenly, there was new a new way of making independent documentary film. And these films were also, uh, in its way, they were told were very different. In the 60s and, and 70s started very much these genres that we call observational cinema, cinema variety. Uh, uh, they have many names, uh, but the whole thing was that the filmmakers were saying, we believe in the reality. We shouldn't have somebody who with a voice over telling us what we should do. Just look at the reality as it is. There is a truth in reality. And, uh, and, and uh, often, and we, for example, you probably know Frederick Weisman. It was very much, the films were very much dealing with um, institution. It was criticizing institution. It was, we are going in there, we are the fly on the wall that observing reality as it is. The format was often very long film, or uh, it was, you know, two hours, three hours, was not unusual. So, uh, but it was also collective stories. It was group of people. They were questioned the authorities. They were part of a left reaction towards these institution. It was, I will say, in the 80s that I started to edit documentary films. And I had worked as assistant on fiction. And I, I learned a lot from it because uh, I would say observational cinema there you have, you shoot a whole lot of material and then it is in the editing process that you are making a structure or a form or out of it. So it's, it's, I would say often the method, it's very much like an anthropologist that goes out in the field, collect material, and then without start to be too controlling what you are collecting, you are just collecting a lot, and then you go home, and then you sort out your material and try to find some categories to, uh, to get hold of this material. But with the, so, so I got, uh, so I learned in that period very much to look at the reality 
and also to look for what it's, is principle in the reality. What is, if you're making a film about hospital, then it how does a hospital work? It is not, ah, here is a good character, you know. It's an institution, so there, there should be some principle and not exceptional themes that you are dealing with. But I was also, because I was a young man, and as I told you, fiction was the real thing for me. So I was also, I felt it was a little Puritan and a little boring. Come on, let's use all the whole toolbox of filmmaking. You know, music, you could hardly use music, maybe then as end credits, right? But all the different things that I got with me from, uh, from, from fiction, I couldn't use in the same way. So I was very happy <laughs> when also the documentary world started to change uh, because it started suddenly in the 90s, started much more there, the new mantra was story. And was that we were starting to making documentary films that looked like fiction. It became stories with single characters that was going through a, a character development like in fiction, it was resolved the same we were using music, we were using all the tricks from the fiction in storytelling. And uh, there I really could use also my fiction background in documentary. And what also happened was that suddenly came generations out. Now there also was started to come ed education in documentary filmmaking. So suddenly you had students who were beforehand, a lot of documentary film was also made by people who knew something about the subject who was specialized or were working with handicapped children and was starting to make films. And then, but it was the subject that was the main force. Now suddenly we had some youngsters that was, their main interest were not a subject, but was to make film. And they were much more, uh, what should I say, uh, uh, in, yeah, they were interested in, 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 in storytelling more than the subject. So there we, uh, I would say, I, because I had this fiction film background also, then also I clicked with a generation that was maybe 10 years younger than me. And we wanted to tell story, we wanted to use the whole palette, all the tools in filmmaking. And success it is that somehow you are in sync with your time. So suddenly we were, I was making a lot of documentary film in these strong narrative tradition that look like fiction. So you can say that, yeah, 
the, the, the kind of state-sponsored documentary film, the observation or the reality is good as it is, look at it. And now was a period where we were making documentary films that in its narrative core look like fiction. Then it, it's also its reaction where the different trends are reacting to one another. But if we look further up in a bigger perspective, what also happens in the 1890s and so on, it is we go into a period where uh, we, in the West, human beings have freed ourselves from all kind of social restraints. There have been sexual revolution, women's lift, ancient authoritarian, all this. So the whole focus was on the individual. So this character driven where the individual is in the center, you know, fitted very well with how we human beings also started to see ourselves. Not only filmmakers, you know. We don't believe in God anymore. We believe in psychology. You know, in the 90s, psychology, you know, it was suddenly something that was everywhere, even in ladies' magazine, where unless you were living in New York or Buenos Aires, psychoanalysts, it was something you didn't was talking, it was because you have a serious mental problem. But now everybody was seeing yourself as you are the king in your own life. And if I'm successful or not, it depends on me. It is not the social condition and so on because we have freed ourselves from them. So it was one factor. And then also another factor was very much where does the money come from? It's always, we can always understand where is money comes from and how are things distributed. It is also key factors to how the different expressions looks like. And of course, we filmmakers, we think that we are inventing the wheel or we are, <laughs> you know, but we are part of a bigger pattern. And from this period where it was governmental offices, all that, where the money came from and was shown in school and blah, blah, blah. The key player in distribution and financing of documentary film was television. And their demands to keep up viewers, it was linear, character-driven storytelling. So, uh, and uh, so that had been the, 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 the dominant player for, for, for decades and still are, still are in 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 uh, uh, but I will say with the digital age documentary film have got new challenges because what have happened it is that uh suddenly everybody is a filmmaker. Because of our mobile phones, and all of us are taking photos, we are making 
visual narrative where we are self-staging ourselves so suddenly the people in front of the camera has a conscious about what they are doing. We have started to live in what I call the performative age. And that creates new challenges for us documentary filmmakers. Because what we are seeing more and more, it is that when we start the camera, then people are starting to perform. They are performing because they have a kind, they think they have a kind of knowledge of, of how do I want to control my narrative. And they are performing. And to me, uh, That's, <laughs> yeah, they, a lot of time they're just bad actors, you know. Because what I think is uh, the strength of, our, of documentary film, it is what I call authenticity and I'm very aware that authenticity is not the same as as facts but authenticity it is that we human beings are feeling have a feeling that something is true and There, I think that we human beings are very smart. We are both smart and we are dumb. Because we are dumb because we think it is what we are saying that is the most important, you know, and because that we can kind of think we can control. But I think in real life, part of reading each other, it is built as much on a subtextual reading of one another. You know, it is not only the words. It is how we are looking at each other, how we, the, the, which is an emotional reading. Right. So, so if we are losing that, then we are losing everything. You know, what, why do, do we laugh and cry when we are watching a fiction? It is because the actors have somehow filled a dead text in a script with a subtext that makes us feel this is a real human being, right? It is something, it is also all the things, it's the pausing, it is the, the, all those things that is part, else we wouldn't cry and laugh and enter these characters. So the danger is that, that with the performative age, then it is a big challenge for the filmmaker to break that performance when we come out in the real world. Because people, and especially people who are used to, uh, to media and so on, they have built up a kind of narrative and a story and where they can say the most tragical 
thinks and so on. Typical, you know, a rock musician. Yeah, my father was an alcoholic, so therefore I, I found the art and so on. And they have told that story hundred times in interviews and so on. So when they are saying it, maybe it's a tragic story, but there is not an authentic now in the moment they are telling it. So it becomes flat in a way. We all know reality shows, right? Reality shows should be pure uh, reality. You are putting some young people in a space and then you have all kind of, you know, they are fighting, they are crying, they are fucking, they are falling in love. But we don't think it's, it's real. I think you can have a, some pleasure of, of watching, but I think you are watching it with a distance. You are not involving because I think this feeling of authenticity, it is also where you give up. You, you are into them. You are identifying. And if it's just somebody who's performing, you are not, you, you don't give your emotion into that. You can watch at it, but you don't, and and that is a pity because, in the in in the the big filmic experience, it is the audience that, with their own life, is 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 telling or putting half of the film together. I will say the last it. it a film is first finished when it has reached an audience and get an echo from a personal experience. And we will not do that if we feel that people are lying to us. It's very simple. So, so for me, that is one of the things that, that, that we really have to take care of and which is, it, it, it had changed. Uh, and always when I work with directors and, and, and uh, talking in the development phase of the project, I'm always, asking my director what's in it for your character why are they why do they want to be part of the film what are their motives because the danger is if we are not aware of what are their motives and what is the director's motive which should never be the same. For me, because as a filmmaker, the film director has another look at these. But then you can are much, much better in, in uh, navigate your shooting and your connection with that person because you know why they are into this film. It can be very, every, it, it's not a valuation that it should be for some good reason. It can also be like we did in the act of killing where just were consciously using these killers need to perform to tell a story, you know. He was their vanity and that they were proud of what they have done. Uh, 
and there you have to understand the context that since the genocide there in, in um, Indonesia, these killers were praised as heroes, you know. And so nobody had kind of questioned what they, they did in public. They were put on stage and say, wow, you are the heroes that killed the communists. So in their self-image, they were heroes because their society said they were heroes, right? But in the process of filmmaking, we were never interested in just the performance. I'm not sure I ever have edited that film if it had just been the performance layer. It would have been disgusting, you know, to see people just boasting of the most horrible things, you know. No, what we were looking for was the crack in the performance. The moment that Anwar couldn't play the victim because suddenly he has a wire around his neck and stop the shooting and say, hey, 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 and go out of the character or out of his control of his character. The authentic now. And there it's, it's interesting... A friend of mine is professor in psychology, and they are also in the psychological world, uh, is dealing with the word authentic. And then I was asking him, what is the definition of authenticity in the psychological world? And that is losing control. It is the moment where we are losing the control. So in these cases where we have these performers and so on, it is, of course, also a question of making situation where your characters are not in control. I will say with interviews, for example, the best bites of interviews uh, often happen towards the end when people are tired. When they, because also if you would make an interview with Nils P. Andersen, I would be, okay, now I have to be in very clever and smart and also a little funny and so on. So I will be very kind of controlled. But after two hours, then I will lose my guards and maybe show more about who I am, right? These kind of things, I remember it wasn't a film I was editing, but a famous Danish uh, stand-up comedian that now he had a new show and he had been in a personal crisis and he was saying all this kind of on the paper narrative, ah, it's a touching story. But I never felt him. But then there was some interview that was made in a car while he was driving. And there I felt much more a feeling of authenticity because he was, of course, also concentrating on the traffic. So some of his attention was somewhere else. So this about... Losing control, it counts, you know, for the people in front of the camera, but it also counts for us as filmmakers. It is that we also sometimes dare to put ourselves in situation that we can't control. Because there is also something magical happening. And of course, nobody likes to be out of control. It's against our nature. Yeah, maybe we do get out of control Saturday night when we get pissed and, or high or whatever we do. That is a little relief. But basically, we want to be in control. And especially as filmmakers where we 
you know, have gotten a lot of money, but sometimes it's important to remember we should also sometime be in that zone because there can appear moments that is unrepeatable, you know. We can always ask a man walk into the door again and then we get the right framing, but we are also looking for these moments of that only happens once. These golden moments, that is the whole strength of documentary film. And if we want to control everything and have uh, in visually and everything and make beautiful film and, and so on, and we know what's, how the world looks like and so on, do fiction. There you can control everything and so on. So, so, so to me, I, I think uh, we should throw ourselves out. Of course, we should have a direction, but we should also believe in reality. And some way I, I started my, my story saying, ah, this observational cinema blah, 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 uh, was a little boring. But here, 40 years later or more, I would say I'm, I'm, I'm much more that back to reality somehow. I feel also that in the digital world where we are spending so much time in a kind of unreal, real or whatever, where we know, we know things on the internet, you can be lying, you can, all those things and, and all this performativity. So I feel that in our time, there is a big longing for authenticity. And that is one of the things that people don't get anywhere else. And that is our change for documentary film. It is because what is on television, yeah, it's talk show, it's sports, it's news, it's, it, that is the thing, the internet, it's very short, it's this hectic where you don't believe and get addicted and fascinated and you know it's a lie. And their fiction had left total reality. If you look at, at Hollywood, they are making superhero films and making, uh, yeah, all kind of fantasy and influenced by the game world. So that makes a space for us to show the world and be good at looking at the world and trusting the reality somehow. And, and, uh, and I think I said it before, but, but a, 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 a symptom of this longing for, for reality, it is what is, is social media full of. Cat videos, baby videos, something unpredictable happened because we are so fucking tired of people performing, acting all the time. So that is my hope for, 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 or oh, that is where I see our, our, our big uh, role in the world. We are needed. We have some other, we are the only one who are showing the world as it is, you know. And uh, as the world look now, there is more need for documentary film than ever, I will say. And uh, uh, that we have a voice and that we are looking at the world as it is instead of all kind of 
fantasies and controlled political narrative. And, and, and uh, yes. Good. Uh, I think we should have a talk. Instead of it's me who is talking, then so I will open up the floor and hear some questions, disagreement, point of view, reflection, whatever. Do we have extra microphones somewhere? So, and I take a little water. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I will. Uh, yeah. <laughs> With the mask, the <laughs> mask and glasses, and, glasses. and then I have got hearing aids, so okay. that is really kind of a mess with these masks. Yeah. No, congratulations, your uh, master class, your talking, let's say, your reflection is very inspiring for, for us uh, as documentary filmmakers and uh, I guess for the audience too. Uh, I just want to start from the end of what you have said and something that's very important, I think, uh, I believe myself in my experience, in my work very much. And I wanted just to take um, an experience we had in Greece um, about um, authenticity, about truth, about reality. Um, it was at the beginning of the, the, the crisis, the Greek crisis. Uh, in this country, I have been living 43 years now. Uh, I come from somewhere else. I become Greek. And um, what was uh, striking me in those uh, 30 of these uh, 43 years is that the people were performing something else than they were because they didn't like themselves and they tried to play something what's in inspired from the serial they want to see and, uh, and suddenly the reality uh, become, uh, started to, to look like the serials uh, because at the beginning I said, but where do they find those Greek people? I never seen around me. And then they create those people. And suddenly I arrived uh, and they were living, you know, spending much more than money than they have. And uh, living in, a, trying to convince themselves they're living in another world. And suddenly the crisis arrived. Uh -huh. Everybody was waiting for it inside of him because everybody knew that he was lying to himself. But they didn't want to recognize that, you know, like the, the, uh, your uh, homonym Anderson and his, uh, uh, the, the emperor uh, was, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, was <laughs> naked yeah. and no one to, uh, uh, everyone. But naked, yeah. Yeah. Ah. And, um, and these are the, those, those, those days, uh, my colleague and me were, doing documentary, personally I was, I'm an old din dinosaur and I make, still make Cinema Verite. And um, I had uh, made a, a film about the Greek courts, which is an uh, observational documentary of the courts, ordinary courts, but which, saw, which shows how the people are uh, worrying and, and fighting about the small things in the reality, which could be ridiculous but doesn't show uh, a face bad of them. It's very human, very ridiculous, but very human, very moving. And this film, had, like every documentary, I guess, in the, the period, in, uh, two, it was in, uh, released in 2009. 
and it was shown in uh, theaters, but you know, like they show documentary in theater for one week, two weeks, oh. and then on TV at uh, one o'clock at night, you know, the Greek TV was. Uh, uh, support of the film, you know, uh, they show uh, it at one o'clock at night, nobody will see it. <laughs> and by and uh, the first screening on TV made, uh, w uh, TV was very proud because they make uh, with this film 2.1%, they used to make 1.8%, uh -huh. so we were very happy. And after one year arrived the crisis. And by accident, they show the film at uh, 11.30 at night, uh, on Monday, but there was a, a basketball match before, uh -huh. and they have uh, because they I don't know the basketball match uh, finished very early. They have to put it was a hole. They put my film, uh -huh. and people told me, "Ah, it's your film on TV." But I didn't know that uh, uh -huh. nobody told. Me. And this film made ten point five percent. It was even uh, a higher level than the American film on a private channel. Uh -huh. And I said, what happened? Uh, and the people stopped, continued to see the film. They didn't you know, see the first five minutes and left. They uh, continued and uh, it was raising. What happened? And my in interpretation is that suddenly people who were performing and telling that to themselves saw themselves and were interesting. Uh, you know? But now what we, after 10 years of crisis, they stopped this interest. And now especially... I don't know, I don't say with the war, I don't know yet, but with the pandemic, they're fed up of reality and they don't want to see documentary. Yeah, uh, I, I think overall, uh, of course, but the documentary world have always been, sometimes I call us, the poets of, of the, the film industry. Nobody wants us, but, but uh, we are doing it anyway, you know. But if you look globally at the figures, there have never been produced so many documentary films in the world, and there is a, a, a growing interest. Uh, that is that is sure even we in our individual countries are are, uh, are fighting to 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 to, uh, to survive and and get our films financed and shown but i will say what have happened the the the, the, the last 20 years, which is a big, uh, another big player or have, have raised, and that is film festivals. Film festivals have become more and more popular among, among people uh, and, and is a real market player. You know, in, okay, ITFA in Amsterdam, it's the world's biggest, but it's selling 250,000 tickets there. So suddenly it's a market, uh, Copenhagen docks, and of course we can't have these figures under the epidemic where it's online and, and so on. I think it's 100,000 people that would never go to see a, f a film in the cinema. But it's another thing that is, is interesting nowadays. It is that the event is popular. This, that it had never in the Western world been so popular that something is just happens once. And I have to be there. So people know, ah, now comes Copenhagen Docks and I go and watch documentary film. I would say when I started in, in the documentary world, the directors didn't even go to the festivals. There was, you know, some small, and then you got those these prizes, they are always quite ugly. And especially from the Soviet time, it was always kind of,
big and heavy and, and so on. Some of those fish, they were sent by the post. And nowadays, you know, every director is, is kind of, oh, their sign of success, it is, did I get to a festival? Which I think can be very dangerous trend, but that is a new partner or a new player in the whole system. And then on the other hand, I will say the big streaming. Uh, which are, they are also, they, they are very selective, it's sports stars, it's, they are only going for the hits, but they have huge numbers uh, of, of viewers. So, so for the more arty documentary film, there we have the festivals, and in the other end, the commercial, where there's big money, if in that, so that where television is nowadays, I would say, diminishing its power because normal flow television is is decreasing. So, so, so the 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 whole things are changing. Yeah, uh, but there's new players and new distribution form. And, and we also have to, if we want to understand the film world, we are part of, it's also good to always to understand where does the money come from and who has the distribution, because that's essential. Yes, are there? There's one up here. Are you taking care of who hands up? So I, I don't do it. You follow the order. Uh, thank you. It was a great talk. And um, I'm always happy when, uh, you know, I, I realize there are people all over the globe that uh, are seeking for authenticity in people and uh, so thank you and uh, my question is that um, you talked about that uh, the critical uh, you know uh, our job is to find these moments of, authentic of authenticity when the characters are breaking their performance and uh, this is where truth is hiding and that is what the, the viewers are thinking to see as well. And, uh, and my question is, uh, you know, when the characters are performing, how can you find the reality in the performance? Because, uh, you know, these moments of authenticity are often very few. And... Uh, because we are in the, I am in the process of creating a documentary, and uh, the performance and uh, the truth is at the core of this documentary. Because uh, there is a, an influencer, the character is a, kind of an influencer, and because there is the the most of the film is performance. You know, most of the, uh, the character and. Can you find the reality in this performance, you know, through the editing and all of that? So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, but, but, but of course, as a filmmaker, first of all, you, you have to, to, to say, uh, is it, be aware, is, here you have a character that is performing, is that the film of a performer? Is there this that you want to show? Or do you also want to show a kind of uh, something else? And, and, but I will say with, with, with everything, uh, when are we performing more? It is when we are insecure, right? Or then, so time is essential. If, 
if we, and that is, you know, with television, which normally have very short production time, then you are just going in and say, okay, tell me your deepest secret. Yes. And, and we, and then people, okay, my dear, you know, like that. But having time and building up trust and so many f films that I have been editing, we have, what should I say, when we start a camera, we also start a development in a person. Because nobody in real life are giving a c us, I'm the, the character, so much attention and sincerely sitting, listening, who are you? Tell me your story, you know. So you, with that, it's, you know, our girlfriend, yeah, yeah, or our friend, maybe they know our story, but there are all those social kind of dependency and exchanges. So it's almost only in therapy where you have somebody who, with the same intensity, are trying to find out who you are and spending a lot of time with you. So time is essential if you want to find a core of a human being, you know. And, 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 and that I can see in a lot of... And you can also see... If, Come on, with the act of killing, even that Josh was using these guys' performativity. I think he was filming with Anwar over a period of five years, you know, and slowly were pushing, well, pushing or, or encourage. Anwar to go deeper into his nightmare. So it's not something you just go out and do in, in, in short time. You have to build up a relationship to show who you are. And that is very understandable. That trust, you know. And the reason why Josh were choosing Anwar, because he was interviewing and meeting, I think, 100 killers. But the reason why he chose Anwar was also that Anwar had a stone in the shoe. He had his nightmares. So even he was saying, ah, we kill with wire, all that. There was a vulnerability. There was something underneath. And slowly in this process, he was just was saying, even first it was just giving them full space for their horrible performance, which of course also gave them trust in Josh. And then slowly were kind of, what was it, with these nightmares and opened up that space. So I don't know if it was an answer to your question, but, but time is essential. And, 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 and somehow I think it's, sometimes we are making... maybe film more complicated than it is. It is like human relationship. You know, if, <laughs> if, if, and also if, again, if, if you want to people to open up, then you have to give somebody something of yourself. You know, it's normal human interaction if that we are, I show you some of my vulnerability also, and then you also dare to show some of yours. So this, I think, is, is important. 
Yes, are there? There's one. Good morning, Mr. Mr. Anderson. Thank you for your masterclass. Um, you mentioned that uh, nowadays with uh, the social media, everybody is a filmmaker, everybody can be a filmmaker. And um, it's very interesting because we see lots of people working for years and years to create their idea, what they want to tell everybody. And suddenly you open up your phone one day and you see that uh, a video that, got, that was made in just a few minutes uh, got millions of views. <laughs> and everybody has uh, achieved something that the filmmakers or we try for years. Um, it, it, it sounds absurd, I, I believe. Like, and my question is, do, does the, the audience seek for authenticity in, this, uh, in these videos? On, or is it just um, uh, something so simple, so catchy, like a, a, a popular pop song that uh, ah, ah. makes um, some videos so viral? And um, yeah, wh wh what do you believe? Do we seek for authenticity in these videos or is, is it just that uh, it stuck in our mind and it's, it's so yeah, funny, yeah, yeah. so simple that everybody likes it and doesn't need <sighs> to think in order to understand it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah. Yeah, but it, 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 it's... I, I think that, that, that uh, in the future we will see new art forms that is connected to the internet and maybe already is there. But I'm too old to understand it. And to me, it's just some pretentious, you know, you know, like in, uh, but, uh, so, so, so for sure, uh, But 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 I also I, I I don't think that I I think people want different things, and it's not that you only eat potatoes or you only eat candy. I think audiences can watch a three thirty seconds video clip on some social media and get something out of it and and uh, uh, watch action or a comedy in the cinema and watch a documentary film. I, th I think that uh, but 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 for sure the the, the internet, is is uh, is very much performance, and where I come from. But come on, I'm a dying race. You know, it's you are young people who are bringing the the expression of film forward. You know, it's you who take over. You know, and find way to express how what does it mean to be a human being on, on earth and find new ways of telling stories. And there have always been this combination of technology, a market, and a, a, a kind of artistic or individual expression that goes in the whole history of art. It has been a friction between those things. But one of the things that is interesting, for example, for me, it is that, uh, and I think it's because of, of, of the internet, that the tempo in film over the last 20 years have gone down. The editing tempo in, 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 in the, 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 the fiction film world. And that is so, and also where we see that, that 
you know, when I was doing fiction, a fiction film should be 90 minutes. And there were all kinds of theories that it was the attention span a human being could have. It was maximum 90 minutes, else they should pee or they lost their, their concentration. Now most Hollywood film is over two hours, you know. And are slower, of course, there are action films that is, but in general, the tempo is slower. And that, I don't know if it support my, my, my theory of, about authenticity, uh, but at least it shows that it's a reaction to the fastness of the internet. When we go to the cinema, we don't mind sitting down, watch the big images on a big screen and go into. That is what we want to pay for because the, 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 the speedness we get all the time on the internet. So we want something else. I don't know if it, that was a, it was a reflection at least, maybe not an answer, but the future, it's very hard <laughs> to come with. <laughs> With with precise answers. Yes, you are you are in charge. You are in charge. Sorry. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, this is much more a masterclass of documentary filmmaking than editing. I imagined uh, to hear more from the editing part, but I loved what you said. It's really interesting and inspiring, and for me also encouraging. As everybody talks about the series, and it's so commercialized that I feel a big pressure to keep on doing the documentaries I like as the poet that no one wants but so it I, it feels good and it gives like courage to keep on doing so but I'm interested in the in the editing part like what is when do you come in when do you start to look for the story that you are seeking together with the director and what is the time you give yourself to find this story like what amount of time do you invest in like the act of killing or your other documentaries to come to this point because like the chaos is big and um so i would be interested in in this specific part of your job i have a full i think 15 pages chapter in my book where i describe the whole process of so so I, I'm afraid if I open up for that then it I will speak for a half an hour because there is a certain loyalty in that that so and 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 like with all kind of now I chose was choosing this as I started to say my book is a mess because it wants like filmmakers to have the whole world in just one book like filmmakers they always i'm sitting there and saying to my director but you can't have the whole world in one single film but that i have also tried with my book so and here with a master class then i ch was choosing this more historical perspective which is one of the narrative line in the book and I, but i have also something about very specific how do i do not saying that it's it's the right way but the whole book it is it is my way and maybe you can mirror yourself as a filmmaker and that will help you to find your way so is that okay that's a, that's a <laughs> Thank you for your interesting masterclass. Uh, I have more questions than answers from your masterclass. <laughs> uh, I want to ask you about the reality that you are mentioning. You have to speak in the microphone and yes. loud. I want to. Because I was flying yesterday, so my hearing okay. is blocked. So. Sorry, uh, I want to ask you more. What means reality? For example, if we get the reality from the Lacanian perspective, the real, the reality actually is something that you have inside us. It's a chaos. And when we express something, like now I'm using words, for example, this is symbolic symbolism. 
when you have the camera and we press the record button, we have two things. First, we record the image. Actually, it's like a, it takes a mimic of something happening in front of the camera. And we have the microphone that also make a mediation of what is uh, the sound about. So actually, when you have the footage, we have a symbolic representation of something that we call it reality. But actually, reality is something inside us, like symbolic. So somehow, when you say that I want to have the real thing, what is this real thing? And for example, also, we, you mentioned verite, the truth, or the direct cinema, the fly on the wall, all, all these kinds of notions. What is real? And I want to comment also, there is a kind of a film like the, the Holy Mountain from Jodorowsky, and the end scene of the film talk about this kind of real. The, the, the actor says, we are not real, we are uh, illusions. Let's break the reality, and they go out of the, supposed to be from the film. And we see all these kind of things. So my question is, what is real, and how you define it? <laughs> Yeah, what is real? But I, but I, of course, that is a, a, a kind of. Uh, of course, there is always, and, and, and when you press the button, you are choosing some part of of, 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 of of something so there is always an interpretation of of the realness but where I see when I'm talking about back to the reality I'm talking about where we have seen a period where we are mimicking the fiction. The directors are going out. The whole system is based on stories. Every pitch, what is your storyline? You're, you're sitting there pitching and finding money to, to film where you're inventing stories to make the people who are paying make them sure that they get a film. You don't know. And there, I will say, compare with that, our there, in, and then I see these very control film where you are making good stories and they are moving and, and so on, but maybe they have very little or as little as a fiction. Of course, a fiction is also built on some reality. A novel is also built on some reality. But of course, with a personal interpretation on that. So it's more, where do we balance? And, and I was also talking about this, what I liked about many documentary directors, that they were humble. Of course, they have their special view on the world, but they are also interested in the world and seeing this that, you know, how do we look at the reality? You know, and, and also, you know, when, 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 for example, I have been teaching documentary students, I made up some exercises, okay, to look, learn to look. What do we see on the stage? What do you see? You know, this that somehow we are so up in, 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 in tempo and narrative and so on, so sometimes we forget to learn to look that, to use our senses and our, uh, or to listen to people. We are so busy in making the, the good film that we are using our character just as character instead of human being. Okay, if you then enter this person, listen to this, because there is some kind of real that is not maybe just your storyline where you're just a figure that should, okay, go into a crisis and then overcome and then music in the end and everybody's crying. 
So that is my, of course, the, what is real is a long philosopher have discussed that for generation and hopefully will continue with it. And there, as a film editor, I, I, I'm, I have nothing <laughs> to say. So it's, it's much more how do we see us self in the tradition of documentary filmmaking. Their reality is fantastic and we have to train ourselves also to look and there's a space for it. There's a need for us. Thank you very much, Niels, for this very inspiring and insightful <laughs> masterclass. Um, some time ago, I asked Neil this question. I said, what is it with these Scandinavian films that they're so well structured, they have such a strong narrative uh, and a strong storytelling uh, structure? Uh, would you like to share your answer with our audience? I think they would be interested to, to hear that. And also, uh, uh, I wanted to ask you, because of this terrible war we are experiencing at the moment, they, the festival played again the distant barking of dogs, which probably most of you have actually seen. I think people would be very interested to hear how it was your experience as an editor in this film, what were the choices that you had to make? Yeah. I didn't, it is a distant, no, but, but I have been consulting Simon's film from, from early on. I will say, uh, and especially Denmark uh, have had big, uh, international success uh, and to me there is different factors uh, that is uh, the reason uh, first of all of course we have a good supporting system governmental uh, which is, is essential, uh, but so they had in Norway, Sweden, and Finland. And in fact, they had much more money than we had in Denmark uh, because the national broadcaster was paying much more. The Danish national broadcaster have always paid very little. So in Norway, Sweden, Finland, you could fi finance a low budget, well, okay, documentary film with the Film Institute and the National Broadcaster. But at a certain, I think it was 20 years ago where the Danish Film Institute made a rule that they will max support, I think it was 40% of a budget. So the Danish producers were forced to go out to make co-productions. And where in, in, at IFA, the big, one of the biggest pitching forums, you know, there were five or 10 Norwegian and 10, 15 uh, uh, Swedish producers. There were 30 Danish. It was, and then we had a, a kind of generation shift that we got a new generation of producers that were young female producers. I think 80% of Danish documentary producers are, are female. It's one of the reasons a documentary education at the Danish film school that had worked good. And also that we have had a strong editor tradition in Denmark. So where the editors 
of course, we are also competitors, but maybe because of that mentor system that I have been part of, then the editors, we are seeing each other more as colleagues, as competitors. So we are inviting each other in for screenings because here is an expertise in what I'm doing. And I will also say that maybe part of the typical Danish and Northern, it is all uh, mentality. It is also that in Danes we are very anti-authoritarian. So these flat structures where the, of course, it is the director's vision that we are working on, but the, the director is not a god, and the director are going into dialogue with their producer, with their editors, and so on, and that have created, I think, so, so some countries have a, a very strong auteur tradition where the director is a god and, and knows everything and, and so on. But to my experience, uh, I will say I have worked with a couple of genius directors, but most of of the directors I have worked with have become better in cooperation, you know, in dialogue with, of course, trusted partners that it's not that something goes away from the director. It is that it's, or taken away, it is that your vision is strengthened and that you also uh, what should I say, get this vision maybe communicated better out to an audience, you know, because you have competent people in, 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 uh, around you. So, that is, and the distant box, yeah, but it's, uh, it's also one of those, you know, it's, it's uh, interesting with Simon, Simon, started as uh, came out young director from, from the, the Danish film school and he matched up with Monica, uh, a producer in the company Fine Cut for Real. And uh, they were starting because of course even their governmental money in Denmark, there is limited money but there is a special box for children documentary. So instead of competing with, with all those others, then they were making, I, I, was think, I think they were having, were making two or three short children documentary films, but was also having, he were having the same Producer, so she was also kind of following his. Or it was also she was also quite new as a producer. She had been some line producer, but as an independent producer, so they were growing together and a young editor. So the the the, the film has kind of developed from that, and then I was in as a consultant you know, a couple of screenings on all Simon's film. And then with Distant Dogs, then they were kind of getting out. It started with children money, <laughs> so to speak. But because it was a much bigger story, then they were accepted in the real film world. And now his last film, uh, The House of Splinters, it's the same team, so it's also to building corporations and, and partnership where you are strengthening each other and, and you are continuing something. That is the pleasure also for me as an editor, work, 
continue some working relationship. Instead of, you know, then we are not starting being polite the first two weeks. You know, we have had our fights. We have, we know each other. We know a language. So we start on our next film on another level. There's a lot of things we don't need to say. Also because, again, it is about human being. Who are we? Who are my director? I need to get behind all those words. It's a film about blah, 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 blah. I have to know them as a human being if I should find the, the kind of artistic core in the film. So, yes. Hello, thank you very much for your masterclass. And I wanted to ask, how, how can you manage, how do you do when you have to cut a scene that it is a beloved scene for the director? So there is a director who has scenes that really loves and really wants to have in the film. And you think that this doesn't work. How uh, uh, you, who, who wins? <laughs> <laughs> but it's not, as hopefully both of us. <laughs> hopefully both. No, but, but, but of course, as an editor, sometimes I am, or editors is a hit in the process than the director. Because we are only seeing the what's on the screen, what is filmed. Where the director, they also have the whole shooting that's period that had influenced the whole financing. So they have had a much longer period where all kinds of things that also are influencing <coughs> their mind and their perception of the material. And very important what they have had, it is the dream of the film, which have kept them going for years with no money, listening to all kinds of idiots, all that, what have kept them going, it is the, the dream of this fantastic film that I'm going to make, right? So I'm very aware of that, uh, the kind of psychology of, of, of the editing room, mostly because, you know, I have Again, with age and perspective, when you realize, okay, the crisis come more or less the same time in the process, then you learn to, to deal with it and, and so on. So, of course, if a director is very happy for a scene uh, and and we are then, uh, and I maybe instinctively don't believe in it. Uh, then we, we, we give it a try, and I don't take a big fight because I know in the beginning of the editing process, there's a lot of things I don't know yet. Of course, I should be honest. I should polite say, ah, but I have a gut feeling there's something there that doesn't, but let's give it a try because I can be wrong as well. And, and instead of, you know, taking a big fight in the first week when we are screening, which will cost us distrust and that we are not dancing good together, you know, then 
And then there come a time where when we are starting to have the first draft, there we can start to, to for real say, ah, now we can see a film. And that is where normally the crisis comes. It's the first draft because that is where the dream of the film meets the reality. So there, the, and when I was younger, then I was, and it's a half-born baby, you know, it's, you know, so, but when I was younger, I also got depressed and we started to panic and then we were two people that was panicking in the same moment and I was thinking, oh, this director should have chosen a much better editor than me because else we wouldn't have been there. But now, because I had experienced this so many times, then I relax and then I, I'm focusing as much what doesn't work as what's work. So instead of saying, because when we are panicking, what, what's happening, it is, oh, everything is wrong. Nothing works. But to detect which part works. Aha, uh -huh, this is good. There is a problem. Why is the problem? And also, it's not just to be a good sport and saying, ah, we, you know, we should also look at the good and look at the sunshine. It's not only that, but it's also that by also analyzing what works, then we maybe can find the key in language or something that can solve some of the problems that we have. So, 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 uh, so I wait and then the, f because there is also a point where in this process where some of those darling scenes, I, I have started to hate the word darling scene because it has become a kind of cliche that film editors, because that is a term that people know, kill your darling, and then the, then the, it's a question of often, how do you kill darlings, like we are kind of killers that have to, and, and it, often it's, it's a much more organic process, and some of the darlings can also suddenly, with the right twists, suddenly work, and, and, and it can, it can be part of the dream. It can also be that I haven't been good enough in listening to the... Or I have been distracted by some element in the scene. And if we take away that element, then... Wow, that is why the director was loving that scene. So it's it, this kind of... Either or, it, 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 it's a process and, and there also to take it step by step and, 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 and that is also one of the things I have learned. It is that I'm, that I know the process better and therefore I also know better where to push myself or my director and when I need to be in the more searching open space. So, so that also where, where I was younger, I, I thought that I should screen my, the material and then if I was a good editor, I should tell this, 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 how we tell the story. And nobody can. And it, what I'm losing by having this kind of control, because I want to be in control, what I'm doing, it is, of course, I'm losing the more, what should I say, that I'm trusting my senses. And this take in, because if it's the police that is one to be in control, then I overlook some of those authentic moments. So I have also learned that in, I shouldn't be too smart 
in the or intellectual and think in the beginning of the process. There, it's so important. I take in the material and read the subtext thing that I'm, I'm losing. You know, two months later, this emotional fine thing, which is the core of the filmmaking. It's not the turning point and so on. It is what we put in between our structure. So, so, so that I have learned to, to trust my, my senses and know when I go to my head. Yes, haven't we? I wanted to ask about. I wanted to ask about language and ah. the editing room. So in this game. Uh, of authenticity that you are trying to fish uh, with your director. Um, I mean, the cultural subconscious that comes between you and the director, if you don't come from the same culture, how does this play a role? Do you think language in the editing room plays a role in sort of distracting or reflecting a different authenticity? I don't know. Mm. That uh, I, I, I don't know if I understand your question correct. The language between my director and me. If you don't have the same cultural background, and it's a director, an editor, and a culture represented, mm. so it's a complicated reflection. Yeah. So subjects. Director, ah. editor. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. Of course, I... I come from Northern European culture. Uh, I bring... A, Western story tradition with me. Uh, uh, but to my experience, because I have worked with, in fact, I have worked very little with the last 30 years with Danish directors. I work with people from all over the world, mainly Western directors, uh, but also East European and, and so on. Mm. I, I, I believe it's one of the reasons why I, I, I think it is I believe in the, the strengths of, of diversity. Of course, the diversity or the difference can be so big that you can never meet. So, uh, uh, but I, I never say yes to a job with a director if I, I spend quite much time with a director, not to hear about the project, but to feel what human being is it? And can we dance, as I call it? Can we communicate? Is there a respect that despite our different uh, background and, 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 and so on, we, we can make it. So, so but of course there, there is a, 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 but, but personally, 
and 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 I will say, of course, there is cultural background, but I think the personality overrides culture. To my experience, so we should be aware of culture, but there is also a kind of how can, is a human to human connection can you communicate uh, also in also in a non-verbal process because film editing instead of you know it's also a thing where I'm instead of we are sitting fighting and using a lot of words and it's also trying out things aha uh -huh. So it's in a direct communication. It's not who is best in talking, you know. It is in in a dialogue with the material. So, uh, in fact, I, I would say I have have had, but I have had more problems the recent years with Danish directors than than with people from, from other cultures. But that is, has maybe to do with that I have been such a vagabond the last 30 years and been very little in Denmark and think Danes are uh, rich, spoiled, ignorant people uh, that can be part of it. I don't know. So, But of course, it's something I'm aware of, of course, also when I'm as consulting and go out on on, on workshops in, uh, into Asia, Africa, blah, 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 all these things. But my starting point, it is I do my honest best to understand what is the vision that the director has and what is the language and, 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 and so on that we are communicating in. And can I see myself, do I find that interesting? Uh, and do they find me interesting? That is, that we want each other. If we don't want each other, then we shouldn't work together, you know. Because you can be the best director in the world and the best editor, but if you can't dance, you make each other smaller. And you can be, you know, so, so this that we can make us grow in the artistic process that is so important because else it becomes flat. It is where we create something that is more than the individual too. So I think, should we have the last question? <laughs> this. Answer now. now the, the, the last, or maybe I just make a kind of, should we have an open ending, you know, in, in there's kind of, in, in storytelling, there's three kind of main, it can be a tragedy, a happy ending, or an open ending, what do you want? Opening, <laughs> opening yeah, it's, it's this kind of typical, I don't really, it's more arty, open ending. Okay, we're trying to make an open ending. Last question. Oh. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Nils, for, the, for sharing the, uh, your experiences and your knowledge. Uh, and uh, maybe I, I'm opening something huge uh, with this question, but I don't know. But uh, um, I always wondering uh, the importance of the cut in a sequence, because um, you talked about the uh, time. And you talk about, uh, about the authentic, uh, authenticity. So um, for me, this is something uh, quite important when I see a documentary. And uh, I'm wondering if um, uh, with the cut, or actually with the amount of the cuts we use in a sequence, uh, we are losing uh, cuts. Uh, uh, cuts, sorry. Uh, cuts. Cuts, cuts, okay, cuts. Sorry, 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 sorry. Cats, sorry, sorry, sorry. and I was already sorry, sorry. out there. Cuts, cats, cuts. you can control. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. 
And for example, I know Wei Wei, he loves cats. We always have cats in his film. Oh, sorry, cats, oh, sorry. yes. <laughs> uh, so when you edit um, uh, the less is the better for you to try to keep this authenticity, this reality, because as a part of the audience, uh, it helps me a lot mm. when I see a whole sequence mm. with less cuts, mm. Co uh, cuts, sorry. Mm. Uh, so um, <laughs> I don't know if this mm. uh, your personal mark when mm. you edit or not, uh, how do you deal mm. with the... With yes. This? No, but, but, but uh, of course, when I was young, I, I thought that the more cuts I was doing, the, the better editor I was. You know, I really wanted to show off how much the, the editing and how good an editor I was. But nowadays, the less cuts I can make, I'm more happy. And that has maybe also to do with this feeling of authenticity because, and then it is again for me, this to find these golden moments, you know, these 15 seconds in hundreds of hours of material. Wow, here is something, you know, because it is also somehow to see them. And there, it's also where I'm talking about screening, not to be too wise, but feel, you know. It is also to be aware of, of, of to see these, because it's these moments, holy moments, where something, it is hidden in all kind of, dull things or boring things or maybe important things but so so i make fewer cuts today uh, definitely uh, but of course it also depends again on the director what kind of film but if it was a kind of you know that kind of film, maybe I wouldn't be interested in editing, then we are the wrong match, then we should have made each other when I, 30 years ago, where I was much more in, into that, and then we could maybe have created something great. So, so, cuts and cats. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was. <laughs> it's always a pleasure for me when we go to come to the Q&A because then I get the dialogue and I think that is what it's about. I hate to stand here all by myself and there I would rather be behind somebody, but it has been a pleasure to talking with you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I have not many, but I have 30 books with me that I sell and they cost 35 euros. So if anybody there is book for sale, I will be sitting outside. <laughs>